Pop quiz. How many of you here have ever been asked to build something? I see a few folks I know are going to raise their hands out there. Some of you have been asked to build something. How many of you have ever been asked to build something big? And you thought, oh boy, gulp. How about this? How many have ever been asked or told to head up a massive project? Something so big, the significance of which is, is really measured on a, a national scale and maybe even beyond that. Anybody? I know there were hands before, but pretty sure probably not. I'm, I'm not even sure what a project like that would, would be today. Maybe if someone here were tapped to be in charge of designing and building the entire uh, Olympic complex for the next winter games or the next summer games, maybe that would be uh, something here that would have the significance of being on such a national and even beyond scale. Looking back, trying to think of something of this magnitude, maybe we're talking about something like building the 9-11 memorial, something there that has significance for the entire nation and indeed for the world so that no one will forget. Or the person who was tasked with the job of designing and building the Holocaust Museum in Israel. Maybe you can think about somebody who was tasked with the job of designing Washington, D.C. in the beginning of our country. We've got a new country, we've got a new nation here. We need a new capital. Ivana, I want you to go out there and design this thing. She's rolling her eyes at me right now. It's hard to imagine, it's hard to imagine building with something with such significance, but still somehow I don't think that even these ideas come close to building something of the significance that Solomon was asked to build. Last week, we saw how David had a desire. He had a desire in his heart. He wanted to build a temple for the Lord. Now that seems like a pretty good idea. God had tapped David to be king. God had blessed David. God had raised him up from being a shepherd to being king over Israel. It was giving him tremendous success. It seems like a good idea. And the prophet Nathan says, yeah, go for it. But that night, God told Nathan, Nathan, you need to go tell David, no, no. Because God had someone else in mind to build that temple that was in David's heart and mind. Well, today we're going to see how that project went. Now, first, let's note, last week when we talked about David wanting to build this temple, being told no, we noted how David did what he could. He did what he could, getting things ready for Solomon. Now, when Solomon becomes king, well, he doesn't immediately start out building the temple. Knew that something's going to happen, but he didn't start out immediately. First, he had to deal with an older brother who tried to steal the throne out from under him. And then he took care of some unfinished business from David. He, he really settled some scores for David. Things that David said he wouldn't do, but he said, hey, you can take care of that. And then he went and he got married. He got married to a daughter of Pharaoh from Egypt. And God came to him in a dream. God came to him in a dream, and it seems almost like a genie. He said, ask me for anything you want. To which Solomon asked for wisdom. And God was pleased. And so God grants that wish to give him wisdom. And then beyond that reward, Solomon with wealth and honor such that Solomon would be the, the wisest man ever, but he would also be the greatest king in his time along with that wisdom. After all of that, we come to 1 Kings chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up there, and we're going to work our way through some sections here in 1 Kings, beginning in verse 5. I'm not going to read right away, but in 1 Kings 5, you'll note that it tells how Hiram, who was the king of Tyre, that's a little bit to the north, who had been a friend of David before Solomon, See Solomon there getting set up, things are going well, and he reaches out. He's being neighborly. He reaches out to Solomon, they have some conversation, and before you know it, Hiram and Solomon have entered into a deal where Hiram is going to send cedar wood from Lebanon down to Solomon 
he's going to send this wood that, that Lebanon is famed for, along with skilled workers, skilled labor, so they can build this temple, and Solomon's going to pay for it all, and he's going to lavish them with food, and, and they've got a good deal worked out. So 1 Kings chapter 6 goes on then to give the details. In 1 Kings chapter 6, the very first verse, reads in the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. And then if you continue to read there, you skip through, you see verses 2 through 6 describe the dimensions. And they talk about that strange cubit there. And we're like, oh, what in the world? Why can't they put it in normal English and say feet? The rest of the world says that doesn't make sense, feet either. But anyway, we get the dimensions of the temple. Verse 7, verse 7 notes that in building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used, and no hammer, chisel, or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built. I see a few guys back there that I've worked with, or I've stood along and watched them work because they were the experts. Little teeny job site. I know they've worked on big job sites, some of you might have been. You ever been on a silent job site? You ever been on a quiet? I, I can remember calling up Steve for something, trustees, and could barely hear him over the din in the background. Job sites are not known for being quiet, but this was such a sacred thing that was going on here. They did everything they could to minimize the, the sound, and the blocks were dressed, everything was made ready aside from that. And when you got to the actual job site itself, it was strangely, oddly quiet, quite an image, quite an idea to think about, not the usual construction site today, but this was no ordinary project. And we see that because in verse 11 to 13, in the midst of this building, in the midst of this building, the word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for this temple you're building, if you follow my decrees, observe my laws, and keep all my commands and obey them, I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David your father, and I will live among the Israelites and will not abandon my people Israel. Right in the midst of building this incredible building, this temple, we have God breaking in with an extraordinary promise. Verse 15 to 38, that's really the end of the chapter, then tells about finishing the inside of the temple. Suffice it to say, that it is very detailed, uh, the work is very intricate, and it is wildly extravagant. Then, it takes a little break, and we skip ahead to 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 13 and following. And what you find there, if you're reading through, is you find a detailed description of all the furnishings that are inside the temple. You know, you build a new house, you build a new building, get the, the building up, the shell up, the less, that's, you're not done then, right? There's more to go. You need the beds, you need the tables, chairs, desks, whatever it might be. We get a very detailed account of all the furnishings, the pillars, decoration, the sea, which sounds weird, but it's a great, great, great big basin for water, for washing, to keep things pure. There are ornate stands and basins and lampstands and all kinds of tools that will be used in sacrifices. All of this, all of this grandeur and magnificent, use all of the stone and the bronze and the copper and the gold that we saw last week that David stockpiled, plus it takes then what Solomon contracted with Hiram, plus whatever else he put in on top of that. This was a massive undertaking and expensive, unbelievably expensive to do this. Today, today when building, it's not uncommon if you're bidding a contract, you've got a couple contractors who are bidding at some point, they might give a figure there in the bidding process, the builder comes up with a cost per square foot to give you an idea how things might compare. That, that, that Solomon built was unimaginable then, the description we had last week of the thousands of talents of gold and silver and copper and bronze beyond counting, 
we can't even imagine what the worth of that might be today. Now, after all of this was accomplished, after all was put together, after everything was furnished, 1 Kings chapter 8, skip ahead to 1 Kings chapter 8, tells how Solomon had the ark, the ark of the covenant, brought in. Now, they started with sacrifice. Verse 5, 1 Kings 8, verse 5 says there were so many sheep and cattle, they couldn't even be recorded or counted. And then, if you have your Bible open, turn to 1 Kings 8, verse 6, and let's read. The priest then brought the ark of the Lord's covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark and overshadowed the ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place. And they're still there today. There was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled his temple. The glory of the Lord filled his temple. We were talking about something that was so magnificent, it's almost beyond our imagination, in building the temple, and now the glory of the Lord has filled it so much that nobody can do anything. Except we see Solomon's response following and begins in verse 12 through 21 with praise and blessing, which leads to a prayer of dedication and finally physical dedication of the building with, guess what? More sacrifices. Lots, lots more sacrifice and worship. This is the story of the building of Solomon's temple. Now, note, this is not the temple that Jesus knew. This is not the temple that Jesus knew. Eventually, Israel would fall so far from God. Imagine that. They're so overcome here by God's presence, God's glory with them, but eventually, they will fall so far from God that God allows them to be conquered and finally, at the hands of the Babylonians, to suffer the destruction of this temple and mass deportation. Nonetheless, this is an amazing story. So what do we do with such a story? Is it just something we know, like we watch an episode on the History Channel, Great Buildings of the Past? Is it something that we just sit and look at? Well, we should marvel at it all. No question there. We should marvel at all of this. It would be odd if we did not marvel at the grandeur of what the Israelites did to honor God, to worship Him and praise Him. This is grand and spectacular beyond words if we could really see it all. Deeper than that, let us understand, let us see that this, that they did, makes real God with his people. God had a place with his people. Just let that sink in. We think about praying to God. God was with his people. But ah, oh, that temple was destroyed. And we, you and I, don't have a temple like that today, do we? There's many people who come in here to Rules Church I visit with for various reasons. One is past week we were talking about a program. It's a really beautiful church and so well cared for and just beautiful, beautiful facility. But even with this, we have nothing, nothing like the temple that is described here in 1 Kings. So again, what do we do with this story? Well, here's what this story has got me thinking about. How is it, how is it that we, you and I, make space for God in our lives today? How is it that we make a place for God 
in our lives today like the Israelites did so long ago. That building, that place that they built, that space that they made for God was so important in the history of Israel because it did. It literally created a space. It created a place for God to be with His people in the midst of His people. A place that they could see, a place that they could go to, a way that they could turn to God and identify and focus and concentrate. It was a place, it was a space to meet with God. It was so important to the identity of the people that when it was destroyed, when this temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, at the first opportunity, it was rebuilt. You can find that story in the book of Ezra. If you want to go ahead and look through there. At the first opportunity, it was rebuilt. That temple, that temple got odd added on to, especially later on by Herod the Great. Yes, that's the same Herod from Jesus' day. And that temple stood until it was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Today, Jews come from around the world to pray at the Wailing Wall. What is that? That is part of the base. That is part of the base that the temple stood on. It is part of a berm, a retaining wall that held up the western side of the plateau that the temple stood on. That's how important the temple was and the idea still is today. Jews come, they still come because that is as close as they can get to the place that was the temple where God would be present with his people. To them, today, that western wailing wall is sacred space. It is the place next to the place where the people of God met God. So what are we, what are we, more importantly, what are you doing to make space, to make a place for God in your life, recognizing the importance, the desperate need that we all have to meet with God, to be close to God, what are you doing? What are we doing to make space? What are we doing that God's place in our lives is truly the center of everything? Now, I want you to note, you don't need a place like that temple. We don't need to go and draw plans, hire an architect or home home weekend warrior kind of thing. You don't need a physical place like that temple. But we do need a place in our lives each and every day where we can meet with God. John chapter 4 tells the story of Jesus meeting with a Samaritan woman at the well. It's a lengthy story. Jesus asked for water and this woman, the Samaritan, is incredulous because she's a Samaritan, he's a Jew. And then we see this in John 4, beginning in verse 10. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. She's blown away by this answer and they continue to talk. A little bit later she responds to Jesus in verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. 
We don't need, we don't need a building. It's fine if you do have a separate, special little place. But we don't need a building. But we need God. We need space for God. We need time for God in our lives every day. We need that space. We need that place where we can meet with Him. A place in our lives for God. A meeting space. Meaning time and practice. Space for time and practice. That is so vital to our life in God. With that in mind, I want you to think of a few things if you're still wrestling with this a little bit. Consider these couple of scriptures here to encourage you in this direction that you will be intentional about creating this space, about making this place in your life. First of all, let us think about Jesus. Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, is where Jesus gives the great commission to his disciples. He's about to ascend into heaven, and he gives them this commission. And he says there, he ends what he's doing, commissioning them to go out and tell. He ends that commission with these words, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Brothers and sisters, it's part of our faith that Jesus is with us. But what kind of place is he living in? What kind of place is there? What kind of space is there in our lives and in our heart for him? I remember, too, and this was a part of what Kay read for us, where Jesus went into that temple, the one that was begun by Ezra, finished by Herod, and he found unholy practices. He turned over tables of money changers and drove people out, declaring in Matthew 21, 13, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, which is quoting Isaiah 56, 7. What kind of space do we have, brothers and sisters? What kind of place is there in our lives for Jesus who would be and who is present with us, whether we realize it or not? Lastly, here are these words that Paul writes to the church in Corinth. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We don't need to hire a contractor. We don't need to hire an architect to build something in our backyard or put an addition on what we already have. But we need each and every one of us to figure out how to truly make God, make Jesus the center of our lives, to make sure there is a place, a space, precious space, honored space in our lives to meet with Him. We need to dedicate time, yes, resources as needed for that space, that place in our lives. Where do you go? How do you meet with God? Keeping God, keeping Christ at the center. Where is it? How is it that you do that? I can't tell you what to do. If you want to meet, we can talk and maybe I can share with you things from Scripture and church practice there that will help you. Ideas, approaches that might help you to make that space, to take that time, to use that time to meet with Him. But ultimately you, each and every one of us has to decide how you really will include God, how you will make God the center of your life, how you will make space to meet with God, and you need to do the work for you. No one else can build that space or that practice for you. You need to do the work. There are many ways or components, and you've heard these before, prayer, Bible, private worship, silence, meditation, fasting, service, and so on. The question is, how do you put them together? How do you utilize these things? Where is it in your day, in your life, that you're building a life of faith that honors God, that is connected with God? However you do it, however you realize you need to begin to do it, maybe it's time to get building. Amen. Let's pray.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you today and we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the promise that we have that he lives with us always. We thank you for the life that you have built for us, a life in eternity to be with you forever. We pray right now that you would help us, an example of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, to build our lives in such a way that you are the center, that you are honored and glorified, and that we can regularly meet with you so that you will make of us what you wish to make of us in our lives. And everything we say and do will be pleasing to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.